Good. I hope we got that. We can get. The, we can start this off by talking about guitar because I'm. I'm. I don't know. I'm. I like talking. I know you probably want to ask me questions about no, me, you're good. but Take you. Your time. Take you your time. But you fucking. You've got an expertise that's fascinating to me. Uh, feel free to move it back. And yeah. Forth. You just want to keep it close to your mouth. You know. Yeah. Okay. You're fucking around. Today, I love it. guitar, man. I mean. I mean, I'm always I'm a big music fan in general. Like I, mean, I think everyone is. But I, yeah. the thing that I always loved about music was great vocalists. Like my favorites were like Freddie Mercury, Jeff Buckley. That's not even, yeah, dude, I mean, Jeff Buckley. Quick he, story. I remember it was tenth grade. Maybe it was tenth grade. We were like first freshman or sophomore mm -hmm. year. You came in class and you're like, we need to listen to this video. And you made it. You made whatever teacher. Oh, it was in Mr. Gregory's class. Yes, you made him put on the video, Hallelujah and that changed my life forever. Because he has one of the all-time great voices. I'm glad. And that I heard moment, about him. I never forgot that day. Really? I remember, I remember thinking to myself, Jake Rush changed my life that day. Wait, dude, I'm, dude, Jeff Buckley. <laughs> I don't know why he isn't more famous. He has one of the best voices. I mean, he's really famous for that one song, Hallelujah. Yeah. And I mean, for good reason. I mean, that he that's to me that's probably my favorite song, oh, Jeff yeah. Buckley's Hallelujah. But um, he has a lot of other great stuff. I mean, he's he just so talented. Like, he's so all the way. Around. He was a really good guitarist too. Maybe not as good as John Mayer, but he's but he's. Well, a I mean, it was much, a different type yeah, of guitar playing. Much better vocalist than John Mayer, though. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. John Mayer's well, actually not that great of a vocalist. Well, he's he really openly not. said it, and I forgot what interviews was a long time ago. He was talking about it was right before he played the Grammys, and uh, or it was right before or right after. And someone asked him like why he wasn't singing, why he didn't sing at the Grammys, and he told everyone he's like it's the, it's the basically an award show for like the prestigious of like you know musicians, and the best of the best. Best of best. He's like, and I'm a guitar player. Yeah, you're gonna put me in that realm. So I played guitar. I'm not a singer. Right. And right, it, right, it was one right. of my favorite statements he made. I was like, good for him. Because like, he's self-aware and like, his voice is good enough to sing. Like Bob Dylan's voice. Stuff. Bob Dylan was just barely good enough to sing his own songs. I don't even think he was good enough to sing his own songs. I don't think he was either. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard a Bob Dylan cover that wasn't better than the original. Oh, yeah. But it's I mean, the reason hard. why he was so famous is because Bob Dylan's the best songwriter that ever lived. I mean, yeah, at least one of them. Well, yeah, he, uh, for me, I'm like, I'm so weird with Bob Dylan because everyone talks about like he won the Nobel Prize and like all this stuff. And he's this great guy and that's awesome and I'm glad that you know music is impacting that way but for me when I look at Bob Dylan as an artist as a whole I'm like well one you weren't good at guitar or singing and was he not that good at guitar? I mean he wrote you know whatever chords whatever he was song. an average it's guitar player yeah. and like his songs were great for the time they were in which is a huge statement like that's important like he was yeah. very much a modern like in his time, they were important. Yeah. But there's also like a thousand other people writing songs better than him that were just as impactful in that time. Like, so which, like which one? Who, who was writing songs better than him in that time? Well, maybe not the same genre. He was like, you know, a folk singer. And he, right. I, guess, I guess he like took over he that. He really redefined that genre. And, and he, he became synonymous with that genre the way Bob Marley is synonymous with reggae. Well, see, that's like the Bob other thing. Dylan was like, take Bob music. Marley as another example. It's like yeah. Bob, Mar Bob Marley was much more talented, in my opinion, obviously. But Bob Marley also was the only one doing what he was doing in his time right. in that area. Right, you know, it right, was right, like right. there wasn't much of a market to compete. He was bringing, him. yeah, he was like Tiger Woods was golf. Exactly. Bob Marley, Bob Marley is. I can't think of one person that dominated their own genre more than Bob Marley dominated reggae. Oh like, yeah, you could take any genre. There's competition. Well, like you take classic rock because that was like the revolution of revolutions, right? It yeah. inspired, and you know, even the hippie scene. Like right, there were right. so many bands that no one. There was one... like an offshoot, like like Grateful yeah. Dead was like an offshoot from rock and roll into like a more hippie vibe. Yeah, and then you have Bob Dylan. Like there wasn't another Bob Dylan. There wasn't another person doing that. So yeah, Bob Dylan paved the way for that. You ever heard of a singer named Rodriguez? Dude, Sugar Man. Sugar Man. Have you Sugar... seen that documentary? Yes, I've seen. That's the phenomenal documentary. I love listening to his music now. Is that he, not the he... most inspiring thing you've ever seen? It's in your the life? most inspiring thing. I... It's it's so interesting, like that he ended up just being a guy carrying refrigerator up the stairs, and he had such a good attitude. Well, I, that's what blew my mind. Like they told him, like, "Hey, you're like pretty much you're bigger than fucking Elvis." In, in and South he's Africa. just like, and he's sitting there with like this trash can and a fire pit, going in a trash can in like this broken down city. Yeah. Remember the house they interviewed him in first? Yeah, he was freaking broke. It's man. poverty. Like, but poverty. he was happy. And here's the thing: it was just, not even phased. I got like I was lucky in that I was watching a bunch of documentaries during that week. The day before that, I watched a documentary on Jim Morrison. Oh wow! Who who during right before he died, he was so huge. I mean, he he had yes, Jim Morrison was a genius, but he got all the recognition that he deserved, and he was miserable. Yeah, oh. miserable. And then in the next day, I watched Searching for Sugar Man, where I where I think Rodriguez is an equally talented. I think I mean there's always I, he's way more talented than Bob Dylan in my opinion. Yeah, he, Rod, I think that he's just as good of a songwriter as Bob Dylan, but he's a much better singer than Bob Dylan. He he, it's like it's like a mixture between. Bob Dylan's songwriting and James Taylor's voice. That's how I would describe Rodriguez. I like that. I like that a lot. And that's why, and, but I think that honestly, his stuff probably went over a lot of people's heads. Mm -hmm. um, like, as far as like appealing to the masses, he's not that, Rodriguez isn't going to do that stuff. Like, his, 
His stuff is so wordy. His his songs. Well, it was, it's also so like I mean, if you think about the way Bob Dylan impacted his time, like how he could sing a song and everyone living in that society could relate to that because there was oppression, there wasn't oppression, all these things. Rodriguez, he wrote from a place like one person could listen yeah. to that song. Yeah, it could be a thousand people and they would all feel that song differently. Right, you know, right, Bob right. Dylan write a song and a thousand people would feel it equally. They'd all know yeah, what he's talking about. Like Bob about. Dylan was like a rallying cry for the exactly, masses, yeah. whereas Rodriguez was just writing from his own perspective. But musically, I agree. I think he was better. Yeah. Um, but I th it was so fascinating seeing like those two documentaries back to back be between Jim Morrison and because and Rodriguez because. It, I, I, two phenomenally talented people one who got the recognition he deserved the other one who didn't and the one who got recognition he had a horrible life was mm. i mean he just drank himself to death was just totally unable to appreciate life at all mm -hmm. and then the other one just like became a normal guy raised his three daughters happier than ever hap carrying refrigerators up the stairs as a, like a construction worker and he wasn't like pissed off at that he got screwed over at all he was just happy he was just happy because he was able to appreciate the uh, the the. Did you say? I think the the key to happiness <laughs> we're, we've gotten deep real quick is just being present in the moment and being yeah. content. I love that. I love that you said that. But here's, mm. and, and based off that, think about think about that. Being present, being happy in the moment. Yeah. Two musicians that wrote right. They both got recognition at some level because Rodriguez got a record deal, this and that, and he yeah. had it stripped away from him immediately. Right. right? Now, most people would be really bummed about that because that's how they make a career. But right. then you ask yourself, where was he writing music from? Because they discovered him in a fucking shit bar in, like, in, Detroit. in the shittiest part of Detroit. Right. And he had his back turned to the audience. He had no interest. He literally just loved to play the guitar. He just loved doing it. That was uh, it. Yeah. It was literally like as important as eating to him. Yeah, when exactly. Look, so when every, when it was, everything was given and taken away, nothing was given and nothing was taken away because he, he still was had just his, writing. Because he still had his guitar and he still had his he music. Because he was still doing what he wanted to do. It didn't matter. He wasn't right. doing it for that reason. And it's like I'm not taking away from Jim Morrison or, I, you know, or any of those rock stars because they, they do it because they love it. They start there. But it you know, yeah. begs the question, at, at what point did it stop being about this is all I love to do and become this is what I need to do to be, succeed? Yeah, it, it, that probably th – something about having that success that coming with – the um, the the coming with the art itself, it, I think it must change. It has to change a little bit, and and I think some of the all time greats are people who are able to. I don't think Paul McCartney ever lost his love. He could. I mean, he's living proof that he never lost his love. Yeah, or like rights, <laughs> like Bruce Springsteen. He oh, just yeah. loves music, and he and he, that's why his his concerts go like four or five hours long. He he's not doing that because he feels like I have to do this so that people will keep coming to my concerts. He's doing that because it's fun for him. He just wants to keep jamming. He just wants to keep jamming. Yeah, and like some the Grateful Dead. I saw I saw Dead and Co with John Mayer. Oh, that uh, already killed it. Yeah, I heard he's amazing. He's it's just he's a lot better than Jerry Garcia. Not to, not to take anything away from Jerry Garcia, but Jerry Garcia is no John. I mean, John Mayer well, is one no. of the all time greats. Oh, absolutely. And I think I think I'm, re I'm really excited too because I feel like being in Dead and Co. And I'm I'm not a Dead fan, believe it or not. I'm not yeah. a huge Dead fan. I, I don't care for it. I'm not it. either. To be honest, it's I'm fine. Not but to be honest, but I'm not that either. kind of music, the ability to jam. John Mayer has such a special. I mean, he's such a special guitar player mm -hmm. that it's almost like because he stepped away from himself and dove into like a huge legacy, it's allowed him to expose himself. Yeah. Expose what he's capable of. And now he's you can see like, he just started another John Mayer tour. I know he's going to be writing new music. And yeah. I can't wait to see him unleash just so much more. I feel like he's get, oh, the older he gets now, he's only going to start releasing greater stuff. Because now, I think he's someone who's so talented that at the early beginning of his career, he wrote pop music because he can write whatever kind of music he wants. And he wrote poppy stuff that preteen girls would like because he knew Dude, that's I what would get him it. famous. His first album, uh, Room for Squares, is one of my favorite albums of all time. Is that the one that has like, your body is yeah. a wonderland? I think that's some of the greatest love... songwriting I've ever heard uh, by really? a guitar player. Is, I don't know. I love that. I've, a lot of, I learned a lot from that album. About production, yeah. about writing, about you know vocal melodies. I mean, that album is just full of information. And, and then, I mean, I guess he, he's mastered everything he does, so he found a way to. I mean, but, but you could tell his as he gets now he, he's not caring. He doesn't care anymore about like getting famous because he already is. So now <laughs> he's just like he's, his stuff is getting bluesy. It's getting psychedelic. I mean, he's just it, sort of showing off his talents. He's yeah. exposing more of what he's capable of now. Which is great because, like, I mean, and I wish that some people like talent as talented as that as that didn't need to get this far in life to do it, you mm -hmm. know. But yeah. like, I feel like we're about to enter an era where like he's gonna start just giving us such gold, such gold. It's interesting, do you, like, because like Eric Clapton is still alive. Like he's, but there's something about getting old where maybe you stop producing new. Like 
When's the last time Bob Dylan's still alive? He hasn't written a like. When's the last time you heard a great new Bob Dylan song? Is there like a prime for musicians, like like, like the way there is for athletes? I mean, I think I think everyone's different. Like, take Jimmy Page for example. If Jimmy yeah. Page picks up a guitar right now, it's going to be just as phenomenal, just as amazing as it was when the Zeppelin first came out. It'll really? always because that's the kind of guitar player he is. He's that right. good. Right. That's who he is. Uh, Jack White is another good example. Yeah, I don't know that's another one. Jack of the White is greats. a guy that just everything he touches becomes great. Not because he's the best musician, but because he cares deeply about it, and that's all he wants to do. He can't help it. He's a rock and roll. He's a rock and roll god. Yeah, he, he, he yeah. can't help it. Dave yeah. Grohl, another example. He yeah. can't help it. Right. I think there's cer there's certain artists of, and forget musicians, just any type of creativity where it's a necessity. If they're that good. So, yeah. and put it this way, if any of those guys ever decided to say, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore, they would become miserable. They would fall apart and they would they would literally physically wither away and die. That, because yeah. it's a necessity for them to live. They can't help it. It has to come out. There's other people that are passionate about it, that are really good at it, that feel that they want to do it all the time, which is just as good and they can be just as good, but they have, they, uh, they have a higher risk of basically having that prime and then right. falling off. So then like... So my brother saw the Rolling Stones in concert, said they were phenomenal. I mean, just absolutely crush it still. But they're doing songs that they wrote in the 60s. How come like someone like, like Mick Jagger, he must be a genius. All those guys in that band must be geniuses. Why don't they come out with any new stuff? You know, it could be a, it could be a matter of... They just don't give a shit anymore? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm obviously not at that level. I don't know anybody personally. I haven't toured with a band at that level. Um, but I, I can tell you this writing and producing a new album as opposed to touring and playing songs that you've already played is very different it requires a different different energy and a lot more work it's like harder well these I'm, guys have been touring for their whole fucking 800 years I swear. yeah <laughs> and it's fun for them. yeah and, and so they, they don't really have to there's, there's a certain like when you're i know this from writing jokes when you're like trying to be creative and like there's gonna be times where it's not fun yeah no absolutely and the <laughs> thing is like look they they uh they make their money off of playing the shows not that right. they need money right right but right. they've done it a thousand times all they gotta do is show up and play their show and it takes that takes a lot of energy and they don't have to rehearse is. because they've been doing the songs for 50 years well even then it's like these guys have families they have other things that they do now right so right. saying hey we're gonna sit down and write an album and then we're gonna record an album that means we're cutting ourselves off from our families our lives we're gonna dedicate because to write a fucking album with four musicians let alone five Six, seven, I mean, that doesn't know how big the band gets. Bringing in other musicians, bringing in producers, right. all this stuff. Spending hours in the studio, getting the right sound, only to release an album that may not be up to par and then ruin your career. That, yeah, So yeah, it's like, yeah. why? Why would they? You know, like, there's certain yeah. bands, and I'm not, I'm not, I mean, like I said, I can't speak for them. They could have a million reasons why they haven't done it. But when I look at it, I'm thinking to myself like, yeah, there's a lot of good reasons why they shouldn't. But for me, I look at musicians like Jimmy Page, like Jack White, like Dave Grohl, they're never gonna stop pushing, even Paul McCartney, they're never gonna stop putting music out because that's what they do. And, and they care more about that than they do about the success that comes with it. And that's, yeah. to me, that's, so do you think, yeah, there's, there's gotta be a certain lack of um, hunger that, that, come, that hits a band like Rolling Stones where they're like, hey, let's just have fun playing our songs. We don't need to beat our head against the wall trying to write new songs that probably won't be as good as the ones that we already wrote. It's like the expectation is too high. Like U2 came out with a new album that wasn't very good from what I remember. The one that they gave everyone for free. That and, mandatory to have. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw a homeless person with a sign that said, we'll take the U2 album off your phone for a dollar. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a good marketing really plan. Funny. Um, like my, uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, one of the best comedians of all time, Eddie Murphy. People forget how good of a stand-up he was. When he was 21 years old, he, he did what is considered by many to be the greatest stand-up special of all time. Really? And then just like a couple years later, when he was 24, he did another special that was one of the best specials of all time. And then he quit stand-up. He just did movies. He never did stand-up again. Because, and, and like he's saying he wants to get back into it now, but he's, he's talked about how he's like, how can I, I can't top that. So why would I keep, like I've already accomplished what I need to accomplish. Why would See, I keep going? That's where the threshold is. Think about what you just said. I've already accomplished what I need to accomplish. Right. It's like you can have all the talent of the great people, be as great as them, and but go in and say, I just want to accomplish this. And once you accomplish that, great. I'm not going to take that away from you. Yeah. If you accomplish it and that's all you want to do, that's fine. But mm -hmm. you're not going to convince me that you're more important and more special to the creative world than someone that can't help but constantly give and share. I agree. Especially as an entertainer. Yeah. You know, my, you know, I'm, my, uh, I always say rule number one is you got to entertain. That's rule number huh. one to everything. Yeah. You've got to entertain. Because yeah. entertainment requires authenticity, requires connection, and requires mastery of what you do. 
Right. The only way to master something is to really believe in it and have passion about it. Yeah. So on all those things come through on stage with the no hesitation factor. You can't, I mean, it's like, that's the, that's the ultimate form of yeah. entertainment. There's no edit. There's no cutting out. There's just you. And yeah. honestly, you can't do that. You can't have longe longevity with that if you don't constantly want that. Right. And like take the Rolling Stones. Maybe it's not that they want to write. Maybe they just love performing. I mean, that's all they uh, want. Yeah, to do. maybe that's what they're, they're they're more passionate about the art of performing, which is its own art form, than yeah. they are about the art of writing. Yeah, and you know, and the thing is, who knows? Maybe the Rolling Stones had writers that wrote their hit songs. Yeah, you know, <laughs> there's ghost writers. There's all this, and you know, I'm not. I, I don't think they were the kind. I mean, they might have had a few, but I don't know. Rolling Stones seems kind of seems like the kind of band that would have wrote their own shit. Right, right, right. You but think. I mean, there's there's so many different uh, different reasons. But you know, I agree with you. There's so many artists that I would love to just look at and be like, hey. You're not dead. Can you continue? Yeah. <laughs> Can you put out some more shit for me? <laughs> like my my brother at went with this concert race out the Rolling Stones. It was like a bunch of like all time greats. Paul McCartney was there. Bob Dylan was there. He said Bob Dylan was absolutely terrible. Was Bob Dylan ever good live though? I'm sure he was never good live. <laughs> I'm sure he was never good live. But I mean, yeah, someone like he, he really should have just. I mean, I don't know who am I to say Bob Dylan should have just been a songwriter because he's one of the highest selling artists of all time. But well, he also had an attitude. He had the he had the persona that was needed for that time. Yeah, Bob Dylan was necessary for his movement. Right, you know right, I mean? right, right. He fit in perfectly. If he came around now, he'd probably he'd probably just be a songwriter. Or but, but, well, think about songwriters today. There's songwriters today that can sing, play, and do everything better than the artists doing them. Right. Right, but they're not the face. They can't. They're not good enough to be the face of that song. Because it's all about marketing. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's that's uh, mostly what it is, right? That um, sucks. Or some people are just better performers. You know, right. this person can do everything better, but they can't perform as as well as this person. You huh. know, they can't yeah. put on an act as well as this person, and that's what people are going to come see. They're not attractive. They don't have the look. Bob right. Dylan created basically his own movement, and he had to be the leader, which right. is why you know you have to respect him. You yeah. have to like give him the credit because because he's not a good looking guy. He's not a good singer. Well, this thing he had nothing going for he him, and then he starts writing these songs with these lyrics that everybody feels. And yeah. then he just this average dude with a guitar went on stage and said, "You know what? This is you know we can have peace, we can have love. Let's talk about deeper shit." And now all of a sudden, you have the entire world following him, right? Because he was the average guy that everyone needed to look at. Yeah, and then some people, and then and then the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you get someone like Freddie Mercury who's just oozing with talent. Oh and my god. He's not even on the same plane. Like, there's like the Freddie Mercury's and Jimmy Pages, you know. As far or Jimmy, I would put Jimi Hendrix in terms of that level of talent. Who who, who do you think is the best guitarist of all time? In your so opinion? we were talking about this before. What were your top four again? I'm okay. It was, so I'll, I'll list my favorite guitarist of all. Yeah, or who my pick for best of all time is. I go number one, Jimi Hendrix. Okay. Number two, Eric Clapton. Okay. Three, John Mayer. Four, Jimmy Page. Um, I don't know who I would put five. Um, I'll just go with the top four for now. Okay. Oh, five BB King. You're a blues guy. You love the blues. I do. So your top five guitar players all have a hand in blues guitar playing. They all right. come from blues guitar playing. Right. Jimi Hendrix started off as a blues player. Uh, Jimmy Page even started off as a really? kind of a bluesier guy. Um, you said Eric Clapton. I mean, seriously, he's super bluesy. Yeah, that guy like invented the blues scale. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. John yeah. Mayer. I mean, there's I don't even need to say anything about that. BB King, the blues king. He, yeah. You know, so so that gives you your top five guitar players, and if and if you try to explain it to someone, I imagine it have to be you. There's a million reasons, but you also love the blues. Yeah. If you ask a metalhead, someone that listens to metal and believes that metal's the best music, they're gonna give you five different answers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Are, are there some like isn't can everyone agree on Jimi Hendrix? Like whenever you do, whenever you ask someone to give you their list of best vocalists, everyone agrees on Freddie Mercury. Yeah. Well, you can like disagree about other people, but isn't is is there a, a comparison for that in guitar playing? I I mean I think Hendrix is that guy. If, He's you, guy if you're gonna have that guy, I think Hendrix is that guy, and it's because he started so much of the guitar playing that we love. Yeah. That's branched off into many different things. He was all, I mean, he also was just fucking incredible. He was fucking like, he good. wasn't t some days. I mean, the guy, the guy was so messed up on stage. Most of the time you couldn't hear what he was doing. He was fucking up left and right. Really? But when he was good to go, when he was sober, it was, I've heard nothing but stories about it being life changing. I got this, I, I met his manager. Really? I uh, got to spend some time with his manager, Jerry Goldstein. And wow. we had talked about it and it was really, really cool. And he was very similar to the few other people I met that saw him live in concert on a good night also the same thing it was like it was like a portal basically that you walked through and it was nothing there's nothing like it and there's no way you can really capture that if you're not there live 
There's yeah. something that gets lost in the in the recording. I feel well, like. what's amazing is, I mean, how long was his career really? Like what? Like it was <sighs> not long. He like died five he years. Died when he was twenty seven. So yeah, he, and he started. He got discovered like twenty two, twenty three. Is when Paul McCartney discovered him. Paul, I didn't even know that. I mean, I don't know that much about his life. I just listen so, to his music. Uh, from what I, I mean, I could be wrong about this, but the story that I know, and like yeah. I said, don't don't <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely fact check this. Okay. The story that I know is that Paul McCartney got a call from a buddy saying, "Hey, you got to come to London because I think he was in he was in New York at the time." Okay. And he said, hey, you got to come to London and check out this guitar player. So he goes to London, and Jimi Hendrix is playing in the back. He's not even the lead guitar player of this band in some shitty club. Uh-huh. And he's playing, and I remember either Paul McCartney or the guy he was with went ahead and grabbed him and said, hey, you belong up front. Yeah. Blah, 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 you know, rest is history kind of thing. I've heard that story multiple times. Yeah. I've heard that Paul McCartney was the one that kind of pushed for him. Like I said, I could really? be totally wrong. I could have been lied to. <laughs> I, I can't believe Hendrix. What was he doing in London? He's, he's an American, right? Is he? I thought, yeah. He spent a lot of time in London, I think, right? Oh, did he? I, I, I know he fought in the Vietnam War when he was like Fucking a... Hendrix. Dude, I, I feel like that must have... Because I, I feel like the experience of, of truly facing death, which most of us in modern society never go through, mm. must be life-altering. Yeah. I wonder if it like tweaked him in some way that made him even Unleashed better. Unleashed something. It, yeah, because there's like maybe there's a certain bravery you have that you can't fake, that once you face death and like look, stared it straight in the face and, and gone forward anyway, then it's like... You have the this bravery that, that you feel like nothing can touch you. Well, you won't hold back either. You won't hold, and, and that, and like, I think that I think people underestimate how important that is for, especially like being improvisational. Oh when, when, my like God, when yeah. the 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 freedom to just let what's in your mind flow through your fingers into the guitar and to not hesitate without, without, without that yeah, process. with zero hesitation, yeah. with zero judgment. That that it, I think maybe having faced death. Yeah. Maybe um, freed that ability in his mind. I mean, it could have been all the drugs, too. I'm sure just, it was a combination. I guarantee it was a combination. He was just one of those guys. I mean, he was so born with it. He, like, I mean, if you, I mean, watching videos of him, you watch even forget the fucking sound that's coming out of it. Just watch how his hand touches the guitar. Yeah. Watch how his, it all, it, like, people talk about the, it's an extension of my body. I'm like, I don't know a single guitar player that I've ever seen in my entire life, video, mm. live, anything, that has ever literally looked like Hendrix does with a guitar. Yeah. It's like, it, it's, a third arm, and it's like he looks lovingly at it while he's playing. It's it, it's it was it's so a part of him. It's almost weird. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's kind of fucked up. You're just like, what is happening? He's he's a genius. So man. so like, there's that level, and it's like maybe he wasn't the best technically. Maybe he wasn't this that blah blah blah. But there was just an essence to Hendrix. Yeah, and he just and, had the attitude, and and he, it could have been the timing. But at the same time, yeah. he wasn't the first guitar player ever. You know, right? The right. Beatles were already there. Yeah, this, I mean, this was BB King had already been around. This was fucking sixty nine, you know, yeah, sixty eight, sixty nine, like that shit already. I mean, at the prime, at the top of his game, like there was, there was, there it was, was it wasn't like yeah, Santana was around, who's another Santana one of the played all-time Woodstock, you know, yeah, yeah, there was yeah. these other guys that were you know technically just as good, if not better. But then mm-hmm. Hendrix just had something. I don't know. I don't know. I wish I could. I could tell you what it was, but you. I mean, I'm sure you know what it is. You feel it. Yeah, you I feel. I, I can't. Yeah, I feel it when I listen. My favorite Hendrix song is Trash Man. Have you ever heard that song? Yes, I've heard that song. My favorite song is Gypsy Eyes. Gypsy Eyes. And really? as only, f- I mean, just for the reason that that fat Strat sound, that we, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you've heard that one. I probably have. I don't it's remember it. Yeah. 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 That yeah, yeah. fucking Strat sound is literally orgasmic. Oh, my he God. He makes sound. Like, what's the, the when um, Voodoo Child Return is the yeah. name of the, that where um, the way he starts that song, it's With like a wah never, pedal. Yeah, and everything. Oh. I don't even. I've never heard a guitar make that sound before. It was like he wasn't just playing notes; he was making sounds that. Well, he was the, also the king of the wah pedal. Yeah, the man, wah he pedal. Was I mean, good. a lot of people. I'm, I think I'm the only guitar player that doesn't use a wah pedal. To be really? Honest. Everyone uses a wah pedal, which is great because it's awesome. Yeah. But uh, it's just no one touches it quite like Hendrix did. He, he like he. It seems like he was. He, Maybe Stevie Ray Vaughan. Maybe Steve, Stevie Ray Vaughan does have it. I mean, he he covered that song and did made the same sound with it. So I yeah. would put Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan in the top five, hands down. Okay, that's who I forgot in my top five. I'm putting Stevie Ray Vaughan fifth, and that, I should put him higher though. I should put him like. <laughs> it's just up to you. Well, see, that's what I was getting at. Because like the thing is, there's great guitar players, and then there's the famous guitar players that are great. Because Hendrix is in all those categories, right? Right. But when we start breaking it down, it's like, hey, if I'm a total metalhead, I'm going to start dropping names like, oh, Kirk Kamet and Dimebag Daryl and fucking, you know, <laughs> all these guys that were just as revolutionary for that genre, you know? Yeah. But are they the best guitar players? So it's a really hard thing to say because there's different genres and different things. So then you have like Steve I and like Joe Satriani who are virtuosos. The moment, like they, they can do everything on the guitar. 
They are the kings of guitar playing. Inve Malmsteen, like these guys that just—I don't even know these names. They shred faster. Their technique is insane. I mean, they—they take guitar player and they make all these guys look like schmucks. If you're talking about technical, like really? just schmucks, like they're insane. But at the same time, it's like I'd much rather listen to Hendrix and uh, Jimmy Page play than Inve Malmsteen. Because you know, they have more feel. They, they, it's just different. It's just totally different. More artistry. It's more personal the way they play. And I listen to, to all of them the same. Like I, there's days that I just listen to sh shredding guitar players just to like hear what they do because it's beautiful and some of it's great. But it's just totally different. So when when you like ask like who people ask me like who, who are your favorite guitar players I'm like, well who are my favorite as opposed to who I think the best are like that's for me it's, it's two different. different lists. That's interesting. You you remember listening to a band? I remember they were big in like. In back in middle school, Dragon Force, Herman Lee, <laughs> Herman yeah, Lee, dude. dude, Herman, Herman Lee. Lee, he was like, do you remember the videos of where he would like switch his finger yeah. placement? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all those guys doing that. I mean, Herman Lee is definitely one of the one of the leaders of that. But I mean, Steve I, Satriani, Inve Mount, like all Andy Timmons, all those guys, they know how to do that. They just didn't go as heavy as uh, when I when we want to listen to Dragon Force now. I'm like, these guys. I mean, I'm not, they're not they're not my favorite. No, I'm not. I'm not a huge fan. I don't. Th I think their music is very much like. I don't know, almost a caricature of, of, of like <laughs> dramatic heavy metal. Well, that's a huge thing, like this epic metal scene. I mean, epic that's metal, been around yeah. since like the fucking 70s, you know? Yeah. This but these guys really lean into it. And, but I think that just technically, the, the Herman Lee was able to play faster than anyone I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. He, when he came on the scene, and they, had, they took a lot of shit, because if I'm not mistaken, they sped up some of their, their tracks on their yeah. recordings. So, <laughs> um, and I don't think it's that they can't play that fast. I think they just sped it up. Oh, um, right. But I remember hearing about that, and then at first everyone was like, "Dragon Force," and they're like, "They're well, cheaters." That could have been a rumor too, because I mean, those guys—they fucking play, like they fucking shred. I mean, Herman Lee, watching that guy play is like, well, "Hold up, wait a minute, <laughs> he, slow he down." Is that that hurts. Good. It hurts to watch. Really? Um, I was actually interviewing a guy named Cole Rowland. I did it on the podcast. He was the only one I did over video because he's in Canada. Oh, yeah. But he's a pretty famous guitar player, like Instagram, like hundred thousand followers. Works wow. with all the companies. Like I was like, oh, this, and I follow him, and he's like one of my favorite guitar players. And he's made a living off YouTube, like covering songs. Yeah. And really? uh, we, we, I was interviewing him, and I was talking to him, and he made a. He was talking about. Uh, he knows Herman Lee, and he's talked to him a few times. And he went when he went to go cover Dragon uh, Dragon Force. Yeah. Uh, through the Fire and Flames, he said that was the only song that physically pain like hurt to try to pull off because it took so much out of you. Really? I'm like, holy shit, dude! Like that's 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 saying something because that yeah. that kid can shred. Yeah. Like he's definitely one of the best shredders I know. Dude, Herm, Herman Lee. I remember. <laughs> I haven't said that name in so long, but I remember in middle school, Herman Lee was like a god to me. Oh yeah, he was a god to everybody. Yeah, he, 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 they really like went away. I mean, they're almost like like not as bad, but almost like the Nickelback of epic metal in the sense. Oh that yeah, dude. <laughs> everyone like, like like oh fuck Dragon Force. They're so cheesy and but they're still technically impressive. Oh yeah, I mean they. I, I like that actually. That's a perfect example. They were, they were the Nickelback of uh, epic metal <laughs> yeah. or whatever genre. I had my I had my buddy Eric come on here and he gave me a whole like education on different genres of metal and how they work like different death core and metal core and like all yeah. this stuff i was like what the fuck <laughs> it's yeah. just heavy music to me and i'm a musician so it's but but yeah i guess some people are just like that's all they want to listen to they're, they're just so into that oh i mean i love I me mean, i got a fucking big old metallica m tattooed on my back like I, really? I love metal i mean i got nine snails right here sometimes i'll go into the fucking heavier shit lamb of god is one of my favorite bands you know really but i'm also you know Zeppelin, John Mayer. I fucking listen to Taylor Swift. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I think that's the way to do it, man. Because every, every I mean, in, in, I think there's a lot of similarities to, to in what people are trying to communicate. They just do it different ways. I love that. Oh my god, I love that. Similarities to what people are trying to just do it in different ways. Just do it in how they feel it, right? Yeah, that's how like Taylor Swift is maybe trying to communicate the same as whoever's writing the songs for Lamb of God, <laughs> but that's just not her her. That's not her artistic voice, so that's not how she communicates. Yeah, it. it's just the expression, right? And, 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 and you have out. to be authentic to yourself when you express. You know, that's actually a really good point because I was I, I at the at the show the other night that you were at. I was I was yeah. I thought about this when you were up there because you were the last comic of the night, right? And there's all these different comics, and I kind of noticed everyone kind of had a different style of comedy, right? Right. So, it, are there different genres of like comedy? There like are, but they're, learning... less, they're a lot less clearly defined. Like comedy is, it's sort of I think because it's only been around since the '60s. It's like such a it's like the wild wild west of the arts. It's yeah, like it's not really. Cle clearly defined there's, there's like in music it's been around for thousands of years so it's like we have names for the notes and yeah. music. everything in music is so almost broken down into a science and yeah. all these sub genres in comedy it's like yeah he's sort of like an observational comedian oh he's sort of like a storyteller 
Um, so did you choose one when you started? I, I, I don't I didn't choose one. I just sort of tried to be funny. And the, it sort of chooses you, I, I think. Well, see, that's funny because, like, as a musician, like, a lot of people, a lot of people totally choose genre, genres. But, like, I mean, for me, when I pick up, when I picked up guitar, like, I just played what came out. Right, Like, exactly. I've never been like, this is what I play. Like, even when I pick up the acoustic, when I write songs to this day, it just, I play whatever comes out. Right. And so I've always wondered, like, you know, because it's not, you don't think about comedy and think about, oh, what kind of genre of what comedy What kind of comedian this, do I want to be? Yeah. Because then you tell people you're a musician, oh, what kind of music do you play? Oh, I'm a, I play heavy metal. Oh, I write <sighs> pop songs. Or, oh, I'm a rapper, right? Yeah. That's when someone says, hey, are you a comic? What, what kind of comedy do you do? I hate that question because yeah. I don't know. What, is, what fucking answer do you yeah, give Yeah, and I get that? people, that's what people ask me. What kind of comedy do you do? do? Those, that, the two questions I get the most that make no sense are, what kind of comedy do you do? And, oh, where do you do comedy? Where do I do comedy? <laughs> Various places. It's, Anywhere. it's different almost every time. I do it. At, I did it at an, I do it at apartments. <laughs> I do it at colleges. I do it at comedy clubs. And like, oh, which comedy? Like, there's no comedy club that I've performed at more than like seven or eight times. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'm not the, a regular at. Some I'm place. not a regular anywhere. I'm just. I mean, I've performed hundreds and hundreds of shows, but it's like they're all different places. Yeah. So like. I, I, I just say, oh, just various places around around California. I mean, and then I've done shows on the East Coast. I've done shows in the Midwest. So I'm like, just all... Like, I it's book a, gigs. Yeah, I book gigs. I'm a per, touring performer. No, I, I get the same thing. When people are like, oh, where do you play? And like, it's, it makes more sense for musicians because like, I get it. There's a lot of musicians that are just look to get like a residency at like a bar. Right, and right, And they right. play, uh, play every Friday night at fucking bar yeah. and grill my ass, whatever. Yeah. And it's like, I don't, but when you say, where do you play? I'm like, Stage maybe sometimes yeah stage. Staring, yeah stage and sometimes I don't even get a stage I was on a tennis court when you saw me dude that was great did you like my setup you made you made a comment about I've never been so well lit I was oh like, that was Fuck you yeah. were the one that, that set that up stuff. I was oh like, all my really stuff. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all my, I, I the studio corner sponsored that uh, show oh really yeah. Okay. Oh, I think I remember that, but I didn't know that was your podcast. Yeah. Well, I told Logan. I was he uh, he hit me up. He's like, "Hey, do you think you could help me out and show me like what I need to do with lighting and this and that?" Yeah. And I was like, "You know what? Fuck it." I was like, "I'll bring everything for free and I'll yeah. take care of everything. The mic, the amp, the lights, you name it. Really? And just tell people about my podcast." That's and so he's cool. Like, All right. Well, I fucking loved it, dude. I love I love working with the comics. Honestly, I love working with you guys. It's a fun. Uh, it's, dude, isn't Logan the best? Logan's a great dude. He's he's ridiculous. He's I love so him. funny, man. He's, he's such so a good. Blast. Especially when you like you know where he comes from. Like he comes from like a, a family of athletes and hardcore. Like yeah. Like his dad is one of the most hardcore human beings I've ever met. This guy like is a chief of the fire department and trained NFL athletes and like you right. know his no he has a reputation for being this hard ass. And here comes Logan the fucking comic. <laughs> yeah, the dude. oldest son of four sons. And that's the way it goes a lot of times with comedians. It's like they they're a lot of times they're the black sheep of their family. Yeah. Or it's like there's a go, lot of black sheep of that family. Yeah. This, <laughs> I remember, yeah. So that apartment show that was that the first time you ever done something like that? No, I've actually done a couple apartment shows. So that's uh, a normal thing. It's I, I wouldn't say it's a super common thing, but it's becoming more common because people don't want to go anywhere. Um, I've done probably like six or seven apartment shows over all the last. Comedians? Uh, yeah, all comedians. Yeah, all the apartment shows have been have just been strictly comedy shows. Wow. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of usually the shows are like total shit shows. Um, like they pay you well, but the shows are hard, and nobody like people don't show people don't even want to show up at their own apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard to get people to see anything live now. So what do you think of the what do you think of the crowd that was there? Uh, they were small, but I liked them a lot. I like, thought I was amazed. I was super concerned because yeah. when I got there and like I was hanging out with the guys before, I'm like, are you guys gonna get kicked out? Because all my equipment's here. Like it's gonna take me a minute to run away. Right. Cause like, do they censor you? Do they ever try to like tell you like you can't make jokes about this because it's their apartment complex? Um, some apartment complexes have done that, but this one didn't give us any restrictions at all. They seemed to. I mean, they had a pretty good crowd. They they did not give a fuck. There was a kid in the front row. I, mean, I know, and I no one gave a shit. And and my friend Jane Johnson, like with the only girl, like went up before me and was like talking about masturbating with a vibrator, masturbating dicks, like everything like you would be so afraid for your kid to be a kid sitting in the front row. Yeah, and there's this chick just going off about, about rubber. Yeah. <laughs> How she was like masturbating with a had an orgasm with her vibrator and like oh, oh the natural disaster uh, yeah joke. there I was mean, an earthquake yeah was, I was dying I was I was she's it. funny she's funny um but it's like Jane you're really leaning into this well it's the thing it's like that's a huge part of comedy like going yeah. there like comedy is like the last her, that last uh the last weapon against yeah. bu- against you know prude bullshit yeah it's the one place where you can go as far as you want because it's funny. Yeah, if exactly. You do it properly. I the way I, I like to think of it is it's like a scale. 
Um, the more inappropriate your jokes are, the funnier they have to be in order to pull them off. If a comedian isn't funny, but they go vulgar, it's way worse than a comedian that isn't funny, but is at least clean. Like, bad vulgar comedy yeah. is the worst. But the more vulgar you are, the more... Like, Louis C.K. is super vulgar, um, but he like, was able to get hilarious. away with it for so long because he was so funny. You have It's like... I think it's definitely like a scale. You have to, it, it has to be proportionate. He was he was the best at that. He was incredible at that. I think he's the best comedy writer for stand up of all time. Yeah, he's I definitely put him in my top three favorite of all time. I think my favorite comedians of all time are probably Louis C. K., Richard Pryor, and Brian Regan. I don't know Brian Regan. Yeah, he's not as famous. He he's like a his he's he's just basically like a touring he's really popular in like the Midwest and okay. like he's not like part of that the comedy store scene he's not like a mainstream guy in the comedy sense. store is such a scene isn't it comedy store is such a scene they're all friends with each other it's like a it's a boys club there yeah damn um and they're all they have a very similar sense of humor to each other but and brian regan is not part of that uh he's just very um he's, he's very much like just tours um like theaters around the country and like families go to see him he's so different from louis ck but he's just so so funny. I would I would definitely recommend looking Brian, him up. Oh yeah, I'm definitely gonna look him up. Brian Regan. Well, it's interesting that you talk about like the comedy store kind of being the boys' club, right? Because you said comedy's fairly new. It's been around since like the '60s. Yeah. Right? It's a new art form. Music's been around forever, and you yeah. know, music's been around for how long? And then all of a sudden, we started having these legends come out in these scenes. Yeah. But you know, comedy's been around for what we call 50 years now, comfortable yeah. 50 years, and now the comedy store is like the breeding place of the stars that you'll remember. Yeah. You know, once again, Sunset Boulevard takes over the entertainment scene. Wait, when when did it, did it do that for music? too well think about so you know you have the whiskey the roxy the viper room yeah you know all these fucking clubs right that are infamous that all these great bands started at and like oh they played here and then they became fucking rock stars and now yeah. you have the comedy store which is one of those clubs that all these great comedians are coming through and they still yeah. come back to hang out and it's the boys club and they go out and do their fucking worldwide tours yeah they do worldwide tours on the weekend and then during weekdays the best night to go to the comedy store is tuesday night because that's when like the famous people who are going to be gone doing big shows on the weekend will work out the new material at the comedy store on Tuesday. Really? Yeah. And you if you go to the comedy store on a Tuesday, you're guaranteed to see quite a few celebrities. Well, see, that's the thing. Like that, not, there's that spot. Like you know, Sunset Boulevard, the comedy store. That's where it's happening. It's going to be packed all the time. Yeah. You know, always. 30 years from now, comedy store ain't going to be the same place it is right now. No, well, but I mean, there's it was the be... same place 30 years ago. Well, like, that well, was when, like the... Richard Pryor and and Robin Williams, like those guys were all. It was yeah, a boys' so, club back then but too. So were the so was the whiskey and the Roxy and all those you know sunset clubs like back in the fucking 60s, you know, yeah. all the way through even the 90s, and then all of a sudden like you know digital streaming came out and no one was going to see shows. I mean, the whole Hollywood scene kind of like fell apart. Huh. And no, I mean, there, there's still cool clubs to go to, but you're not going to go to the fucking whiskey on any night of the week and see some famous band. Oh, you're yeah. going to see some shithead that was able to pay off 50 tickets. Oh gosh! You know like, the bringer scene is uh, is really bad in comedy, but I've heard it's even worse in music. Oh, it's terrible. At least I mean, all I can speak for is L.A. I can speak really? for L.A. and what I've experienced, and it's it's pretty bad. Um, I had this conversation with a with a musician a few weeks ago on the show, and he made a really good point. He's like, it's it's it doesn't bother him, and I'm leaning towards it doesn't bother him if the promoter is putting on a good show, because yeah. there's a lot of promoters that say, hey, I'll just find the first ten bands or acts that'll sell the tickets and by that pay off the tickets so they make their quick buck right and then the show has no one there and they don't promote because no one actually invited anyone they just paid off the people for tickets right uh, yeah so but when the promoter is like hey i really like they go and do the research and find bands that can sell tickets and find play, people that have fans that when you get on get on that lineup and there's like 150 people in the club and all the bands get recognition it's like a good night of music it's worth it totally yeah. worth pay to play yeah, you know, but you have to get to that level. But promoters are just trying to make that. Most promoters are trying to get that quick buck. Oh, yeah, it's the same thing in comedy, man. I, I mean, I stopped doing bringer shows a while ago, but because I'm like, I just can't. Because most bringer shows are terrible because the comics are, just get booked because they can bring people, not because they're exactly. funny. And so, I feel bad. I felt bad bringing people to those shows because I felt bad making them sit through all the bad comedy. Well, actually, I'd, I worked with a company that did this exact same thing, and they booked me at the House of Blues like every month. It was really cool. I played the Foundation Room, like really, mm. really awesome, right? Wow. But and I was playing for a long time, and I would do thirty minute sets. Everyone got they booked like ten bands with thirty minute sets. Wow, um, it's a long show. These bands fucking sucked. Oh god! Every one of them was just terrible, one after the next. There was maybe like one or two people in the entire year that I was like, wow, they were pretty good. 
I showed up. I gave my best. I brought a crowd. I kicked ass. I played my heart out. I did a fucking great job. I take pride in my performance. I take yeah. pride in what I do. I'm I damn do good at what I yeah, do. Yeah, that's you the know? way to think about it. And I told them I want the, I want the headlining spot. They're like, yeah. you're not a band. I'm like, yeah, but I bring a bigger crowd. I put on a bigger show, and I'm good at this. Yeah. And like, they could only give me the opening spot. So I, I'm not going to like make people drive down and try to sell them tickets for a 30-minute spot and then sit through bullshit bands because you just were trying to fix the, you know, fill the, uh, fill the spots for the night. Oh, you know, yeah, it's such crap, such a, right? Like, you yeah. don't want people to come sit through that. You don't. You, yeah, it's the same. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's just... Live performance is so tough in LA because there's such an oversaturation. I'm sure that's the same in yeah. New York. You already have to compete with the fact that people could just watch things on Netflix. People could just watch porn on their phones. Yeah, like the, instead of being there to see. You. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's like there's so much <clears throat> entertainment that you can get without having to go anywhere now with the digital age. That's already like that's really tough to compete with no matter where you are and then if you're in LA or New York or Chicago you also have to compete with the fact that there's way too much live stuff going on too yeah so it, it's just so hard to well that's what I think this whole apartment thing like with Logan like getting with his buddies and like you guys kind of working together I think that's I think that's the next era I really think that's the next era of performance because you're right there's two extremes on both sides so now it's about a group of people saying hey let's put on our own show we'll start small we'll go to an apartment complex or we'll do it in our backyard and we'll invite our friends yeah. Bring your friend. Next thing you know, you're putting on your own show with the comics that you know, making sure the night is good, and you've just pretty much opened a moving venue. Right. You know? And I think that's a huge, huge, huge thing. I told Logan, I was like, dude, if you want to start you know, being serious about this and like putting on more shows, bringing comics, I was like, I'm on board. I'll, I'll show up to every show. We'll set it up, and we'll put on nights of you know comic. We'll bring music. We'll bring everything. Do it. Because yeah. like, there we go. You don't need a venue. You don't need bullshit. You bring your friends. Everyone brings their friends because they know it's going to be all their homies and you yeah. know, good good acts. But I, th I really think that's the future. I do too. You know, people with backyards. I mean, I'm going to I'm going to that uh, backyard comedy thing. This uh, have you heard about that? I've heard I've heard kids about in the, kids in the backyard or whatever kids in the yard. Yeah, I think I've heard of that show. Yeah, uh, it's in. I got invited to it. I was at the comedy store. Uh, what's today today's wednesday i was on monday yeah. night to see logan play the belly room oh really how did he do he did dude he killed it i think I it, was, it was the best show i've seen him do really because he so walked cool. up and just like he, i think he like totally went off his script and just had to like tell this story and then he like on the, he kind of made jokes on the spot about it and he was just on fire. And the joke that's hard to do man i think it was on the spot it sounded yeah. like from what i from what i understood like he that he heard this story on the drive down Really, and then he just like made up some shit about it because I guess it was a true story about like cousins fucking or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, he, that's but, um, the best stuff is when when you th there's something about the first time you do a joke if it's a good joke that you can never really capture. It's hard to capture that magic again. Yeah, it kind of just happens. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, the kids in the yard. I mean, I got a I got invited by one of the comics down there, and Brian Callen is supposed to be headlining it, and it's in someone's fucking backyard. Wow. Yeah. It's called, is it on Instagram? I want to look it up. I yeah, I'll send it to you. I'll, to I'll send yeah. it to you. The tickets are free. General admission is free. Really? What night is it? Uh, this Saturday. Oh, dang. I have a show in Ventura this Saturday. Oh, where? Ventura Harbor Comedy Club. Dude, you got to fucking post about that shit so I know. I, I know. I don't post about anything. I, I Yeah, I'm not good at... With, I'm, I'm so bad at promotion. I need to get yeah. better at it, though. Yeah, it's... it's I'm a, good at comedy. That you're, dude, you were fucking great. I was so blown away. <laughs> Thank you. I was you. like... So I, I kind of want to I want to ask you a little bit of questions because I didn't... Because yeah. you bounced out really fast after the show, so I didn't get yeah. to ask you anything. Right, right. Were those stories true? Oh, uh, the, the random facts that I told? Or? Well, not the random facts, but the stories where you talked about your girlfriend and like things oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, I, everything I say is true. Yeah, th really? there's nothing... Yeah. Is there ever... So I, but it's a big thing in comedy to make up false stories, right? Like to yeah. over-exaggerate a story? You definitely over-exaggerate stuff. Like sometimes the details about specific... like, But like I talk about a lot of like crazy random facts. Those are all true. I talk about like general things about myself. That's all true. Yeah, uh, every, every like... Everything that I, every statement that I make is is true. Yeah, that's every, every statement that I make that is, I'm presenting is true is true. That's impressive. I think that's very impressive. It, but see, to me, it's like it wouldn't be funny if it wasn't because yeah, it's not genuine. Yeah, I feel like the audience would be able to tell in my performance that it wasn't genuine. So, the girlfriend thing. One of my favorite parts of your set was you talked about you have. You have Asperger's, right? Yeah. So yeah. I didn't know you had that. Oh, yeah. But you followed that up immediately with talking about how you don't pick up on social cues and with your girlfriend saying, I was, oh, I'm sorry, I'm boring you. <laughs> I'll shut up. You're, I'm boring you or whatever you said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you were all like, oh, thank you. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. And I was dying laughing. Right. But what that immediately made me think, and I wanted, I wanted to ask you about this because, you know, I don't know much about Asperger's. I don't know much right. about it. 
what it does and what it causes, but you were pretty keen on not picking up on social cues and not right. you know knowing how to respond to things. And I thought to myself, that probably makes you like 10 steps ahead of the average comic. Because uh -huh. being on stage, you have to learn to connect with the audience, right? Right. But as a comic, it's not necessarily they have to connect the audience. You just have to be funny. They have to feel they have, something has to be off, right? Right. It's comedy. So right. you're automatically in that place of like, you could say anything and like just the way you look at the audience naturally, they're going to think it's funny. Right. There's going to be that extra step of funny. And I thought to myself, does that actually, do you think that's helping you in your, in your stand up? Yeah, I do. I, I think that everything that's part of who I am helps me. I mean, other than certain flaws, like, I think that, that I need to get better at like be, like living my life in the moment and being present and all that stuff. And I think that that'll help me a lot with comedy. And it's not stuff that comes naturally to me. I tend to be like a kind of a worry, worrisome, anxious person. <laughs> but other than that, I think that my, um, yeah, I think that the way I'm designed must be part of the reason why I'm funny. And that the, the, I think a lot of times people that um, are some of the funniest people have some of the biggest flaws. And there's no way that's a coincidence. No, not at all. Um, it's that because like Com comedy is like a like a platform for like anything any flaws to thrive. Yeah, exactly, and that's why some comedians live very unhealthy lifestyles because sometimes <laughs> they feed into their flaws. Yeah, thinking that it'll help them keep their edge comedically. I I'm like I used to think that way. I'm starting to think now that like having like a like a, a very centered, balanced lifestyle where you're like you you establish your identity outside of your art. And your value outside of your art and feel content with yourself uh, it sort of frees you to be more playful when oh you're actually God. performing your art because then it's just you're doing that for the moment rather than doing it for something else. That that was beautiful. So I think part of the work that is is the work to train your mind to be happy. And I think that uh, oh. that's part of the work of being an artist. That's that's sort of the realizations that I've come to recently. I used to really take pride in the fact that I was miserable. I didn't. I, I wouldn't say that out loud, but I, mean, I think like subconsciously I did, because I think I had this mentality of like I'm suffering now so that I can be famous, later, so that I can be successful. Like I, I idolize guys like Kobe, yeah. who are like I, I I go into the gym at 3 a.m. and I and I shoot hoops for eight hours before the game. Like people like that, like Michael Phelps. I'm in the pool 364 days a year. Yeah. I, I I idolize those people, and I thought like, okay, I'm making myself suffer for my art, but. It, the the more I would get into that mindset, the more it would just throw me off. Because then when I'm on stage, I would, I mean I would almost like bully myself before I get on stage. Like Jake, you better fucking deliver. Became, this is what you do. I'm on a pedestal. Yeah, I, and, it, and it and and when I started doing well at shows, then I started like raising the bar for myself. Um, and I and I would like. I I, I would, yeah I, I think I just would try to like use negative reinforcement to like whip myself, um, for, for like uh, work harder, work harder. Yeah. And when you're being creative, like maybe if you're an athlete, maybe that mentality, I think that mentality maybe would work. Yeah. Um, push because, your may, body. Yeah. Push it. Like, even though, like, there's no way that those guys aren't miserable when they're in the gym, like, considering how hard they work. There's no way it wasn't miserable for Walter Payton to run up those hills that he, like, yeah. Jerry Rice, they'd run up hills so they threw up. I'm sure that's miserable. And I'm sure there has to be, when you're doing that kind of thing, you have it's to a find. It's little different, though. It is different than being creative. Because what I do is I have to be playful. And I have to, and I'm at my best comedically, like be it in conversation, when I feel um, carefree and content and like I'm where I belong and with people I feel comfortable with. Um, and so I think that I, I've realized that uh, I used to always like put off, I used to think that success was more important to me than happiness. So I would put off, uh, I would be like, no, I don't want to go to therapy. I don't want to meditate. It's a waste of my time. I should spend that time writing jokes. Yeah. Um, but I realized that uh, that is part of the work and that is necessary yeah. to, to be successful, to prioritize happiness too. Otherwise, you'll just you'll drag yourself down, I think. Well, especially creative. I mean, like something creative, it's very different than you know, your body's physical. What you put through, it will respond proportionally. Yeah, exactly. You sort of you get in what you get out. It's, it's very scientific. Creativity is not going to be like that. Right. It's uh, harder to predict. For the, for the cliche phrase, the creative flow, if you will. Yeah. That is blocked by a million things. And yeah, maybe great artists come, artists come from suffering because they have stuff to write about. But it's, it's not that they were in suffering that helped them write. They could write about it, but it's that they got out of it. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's that it's creative people with and maybe they don't realize it but i i believe in this 100 i think 100 percent 
of creative people, which is literally everyone. Right. There's a yeah, creative exactly. aspect to every, whatever part of your life is creative. That cannot thrive unless you have something to overcome. Right. And when we don't find peace in ourselves, when we don't find love in ourselves, when we don't care and have passion for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't set up any scenarios to overcome. So what yeah. happens is we don't give our life something for the creativity to overcome. So we start to manifest them in our brain. We start to tell ourselves bad things. We start to make up shit and make ourselves, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. So that right. our body, our creativity has something to overcome. Right. All right. you have to do is find your peace in yourself, love yourself and yeah. give a shit and stand by what you do. Stand by what you do. Right. Go out, live your life and find out what makes Jake happy, what makes Hyde happy, what makes you happy as a person, what makes your life good. Right. Because then the world is going to deliver every scenario because you're not the only one in it. And then your creativity is going to find that inspiration is not that someone presented something. You're, oh, you were so inspired. Inspiration is you experiencing the world and finding things to overcome. Would yeah. that be understanding it or getting over it or enjoying it to the fullest extent? Right, right, that's, right, right. That's, that's where it thrives. I agree. One, yeah, I, it's just, yeah, I think, and, and, and you don't want to, you don't want to relish in obstacles being challenged. Like you, you want to find you, it, the challenge you can find, like there's always gonna be challenges in life, but you got to find the fun and the play in overcoming those challenges. Not, um, and yeah, you, like it helps to have things to overcome, but you, yeah, like you said before, it's important that you, you do have to overcome them. Yeah. I think as opposed to just, I'm over, I'm working on making it through. Yeah. 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 I was, uh, this is going to be a really funny example. Um, I was watching a movie called the perfect physique the other day. Okay. Um, and it's the douchiest movie I've ever seen. Um, but I love, you know, all, you know, I work out. I yeah, love yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, but the, I don't know if you've ever heard of Greg Plitt. Uh, -uh. Greg Plitt is like, he's, he's dead now. He died in an accident, but, uh, he was like the, one of the godfathers of like health and fitness and physique. And he just had one of those sicko mindsets where he was just like, you're so intense. And right. he was going off on this tangent about like how people talk about what a sacrifice it is to pack your meals and cook your meals and do all this stuff to have the body and to, you know, make it to that top level. And he's like, he based for the gist of what he was saying, he said he didn't agree with that. He's like, that's not a sacrifice. That's a choice. Mm -hmm. He's like the sacrifice He's like, there is no sacrifice. It's what you say. You want to be the best. That's your choice. You say you want to be creative. That's your choice. All the steps that are required to do that aren't sacrifice. Those are just no the choices. That's the same choice. way it is. And he like, he kind of uh, got rid of the idea. Like, cause people want to say like, Oh, I sacrificed so much for my art. I sacrificed so much to like succeed in this. I'm like, no, you don't. In order to do this, you have to do these things. If they're right. doing this, the things that you need to do is considered a sacrifice and you're obviously not doing what you want to do. And, and if it, and if it really feels that much like a sacrifice, if you feel miserable the whole time, then that's not what you should be doing. Then, then you're only doing that for the the accolades that you'll get at the end. If, yeah. if, if you're working out, I'm sure some people, some bodybuilders, I'm sure they do love the working out and they love the dieting. And I, I love that shit. And, and and if you don't love the process along the way, then it's not what you're supposed to be doing. And it, and you you can love things that are hard, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I not, feel like yeah. that's a huge problem. Absolutely, people need to know you can love things that become difficult. And it, yeah, and it, <laughs> and it can be and it can feel difficult, and that doesn't mean it's like. I hate the expression "do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life." You know that expression? <laughs> I hate it. If you choose to do what you love, it's gonna you're gonna have to work your ass off, and it's gonna feel like work sometimes. But you still yeah. have to be able to be happy and be content with yourself and be happy with your life and have your identity outside of that. Your balance. You, you, you have to, you, yeah, you can still, you can do things that are hard, but still be balanced in your life and content and at peace in yourself. And if you do that, your performance will be so much better than it would be if you like spent extra time beating your head against a wall, especially when it comes to creative stuff. Yeah, like what are you gonna do? Sit there for a, you know twenty four hours straight until you write the perfect song, or are you gonna fucking? Obviously, I'm not ready. I'm not I yeah. can't write right now. I'm gonna go, you know, do something else. Go maybe I'll go life. get a job. Maybe I'll go go to dinner with my mom. You know, maybe I'll, yeah. You know, there's like a, an infinite. I could name a thousand things right now that you could do instead of that that are probably gonna be more beneficial to your existence. Exactly. You got to go live your life. And people talk about like, oh, it's that's a sacrifice. You give up those things because you're gonna work. I was like, yeah, maybe as an athlete, but we're talking about creative things. Like, you're not gonna force that shit. You can't, you can't. force. You, yeah, there is something about like. Yeah, when you're an athlete, you put a certain amount, like you can sign to, like, you know how your muscles are going to respond to a certain amount of working out. You can have a trainer tell you exactly what to do and you can do it and then you'll get the results. Yeah. If the trainer knows what they're doing and you're putting in the work. And if you're a professional athlete, the trainers do know what they're doing. So you know what you're <laughs> going to get. Um, but with creativity, yeah, you can't, 
like with stand up, there have been many times where I've run into the issue of over preparing. Yeah. Um, where I, I like try to memorize the exact intonation that I had on jokes on the day. Like I, I, I audio record all my shows and I'll like save, I'll like edit out. Like I have like, I don't know, like 50 jokes that I do that I like. And I have an, like an audio recording that of the best time I've done each of those jokes. I'll like go back. Like I remember, Oh, I, that, I crushed that joke at that one show a couple months ago. Like the, the audience really liked that. So why don't I edit out that piece of that joke and keep it? Um, and I'll like listen to him over and over and over again and think like, okay, I have to memorize the exact intonation that I had on that joke that wow, time when it that's crushed. that's intense. Yeah, I mean, there are times where it, it just completely occupies my mind. But, the, but, and sometimes that can be helpful. Like if I, sometimes when you do a joke, like it can be really funny at first and then it stops being funny and so then it helps to have an audio recording of when it went well so you can hear what you did. Yeah. But then sometimes it can become an obsession and it can zap all the crea creative fun when it becomes too scientific. So, yeah. so I, I would tell myself like, well, I'm working hard. The harder I work, the more successful I should be. But working smart is so much more important than working yeah. hard. So much more important. Yeah. I mean. And knowing when to take breaks, knowing when to leave it alone, knowing when to just go do something that's fun. Just go enjoy your life. Go play a video game. Go read a book. Go well, get lunch with a friend. It's also a struggle to accept that sometimes it doesn't require that much time. Right, right. You know? Yeah, yeah. You think if this is so important to me, I should be spending more time on this. It's so it takes almost like it's a kind of discipline in a way to know when to set it set it down. Yeah. To know when to let it go and to know more time spent is not going to equal more success. Well, it's funny because especially as creative people, like you know, you could sit down and within ten minutes you could write the perfect joke because you just it happened, right? Right. And then you could stop and be like, "But oh, it can't be finished. I've been here for ten minutes. Like I need <sighs> spend the next six hours destroying this joke." You know. Yeah. Then you ruin it. Yeah. Oh, that's it. happened to me so many times. You know, like I'm I'm recording stuff right now that's just one guitar and one vocal right now. You know. Yeah. I'm trying not. I don't want to do any production and like it's pretty quick the recording. Like I do, and I don't I don't do cuts. I do. Do one you sing time it? Through. You the singer sing, too? Yeah. Oh, right on. I do one time through a uh, guitar and one time through vocal. Like I don't. Yeah. I don't do like I'm I'm all about getting that real performance on recording, right? That's cool. But like, and that's hard enough. But even then, like. When you like, okay, I'm gonna record this song, and then by the end of that week, it's already mixed and ready to be posted. You're like, I did something wrong. Right. Something's not right there. Cause yeah. I've heard 800 people talk about their EP, and it's been fifth, like fucking five years. And how many musicians have you heard say that like their best songs they wrote in 15 minutes? Stairway to Heaven, the whole first part of that when oh, it's just yeah. acoustic. They they improvised that. I don't know if that's the recording, but I know they they wrote that like in real time. Yeah. And and um. Uh, a sweet child of mine. Uh, Smoke on the water was an accidental jam. Yeah, same with so was sweet child of mine and black hole sun. Chris Cornell said he came up with that song in 15 minutes. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and that's it's, the way. Same with my best jokes. I could sit. There's been times where I've sit like for months trying to figure out a joke that never works. There are times where sometimes I sit for months to work something out and it does work. So there are times when that, that's why yeah, it's so unpredictable. Yeah, but you didn't sit every day. Like you, you did one segment of it. You stepped away a few days right. later. You came back and a little bit more exposed itself. You know, yeah, exactly. I have songs that took a year to write but if you break down all the time i spent on them it was probably like maybe five hours yeah 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 exact that's exactly right where it's and but then sometimes some some of the best stuff if like i remember so i had a a, a screenwriting teacher at usc who who um was friends with someone who was like a, a writer on snl for a couple of years who talked about like some iconic sketch i wish i could remember which one it was that they wrote was it chris farley it was the, Chris Farley was, he was first of all he's one of the best performers of all time but it was a writer um, and uh, someone said and this uh, this writer told my screenwriting teacher who was their friend about some joke that crushed on SNL and they're like and they wrote it and they're like that's a brilliant joke isn't it and he's like and the writer said it's okay for me to say that because I didn't write it it came to me and that's the way our best stuff it feels like it came from somewhere else like when Paul McCartney said that when he wrote the song yesterday. He said that he felt like he's like I must have heard this melody somewhere else because it, I I he's when he wrote it down he was he, he thought he's like okay I heard this melody somewhere I'm gonna write it down I don't remember where I heard it but I'm sure once I like write this song someone will say hey that's my song and nobody ever did and he's like I don't know I, he's like I have no idea how I wrote that song I, I got away I, with that <laughs> I thought that I heard it from somewhere else but I guess I didn't um I uh, I did an episode two weeks ago with my very very good friend one of my mentors his name is Carlos Platone. Yeah. phenomenal songwriter and he once told me when I was probably like 16 17 years old he looked at me and said all great masterpieces already exist he's like yeah. they already exist you're just discovering them and I've always thought about that and I've always agreed with that all great 
creative things are so, are just waiting to be channeled waiting through to be, because yeah. the way they make us feel feels kind of beyond this world kind of beyond our you know everyday life like the melody in the song hallelujah is one of those songs you, where it's just like that feel melody like a god <laughs> that melody was meant to be discovered at some point well that's the thing it's like as creative people we ha we can't force things because it's already it's going to come through yeah we can only just keep the channel open like paul mccartney you discovering yesterday like yeah. i just kind of it happened it's like because that stuff is channeling through and you should you know it's like you can take credit for it all day that's fine like you're writing it but like to understand that your job is not to take credit. Your job is to let it come through you. Your job is to be a channel. Yeah, channel all that wonderful creative energy through. Like, you know, that perfect joke, all of a sudden you're like, did I, you know, is that, is that, is it really that good? What the fuck? I couldn't have written this. Or yeah. You go back to something you made up like, you know, a year ago, you're like, whoa. Yeah. But, you know, Henry, Henry Matisse, the artist talks about it, the creative process. And he kind of like, I, I don't remember the exact way, but you can look it up. He, he had the best way to describe it though. Cause he talked about like little things, like ideas, like going in, like just imagine them shooting into your brain all day. Right. Right. Eventually that's going to fill up. If you don't open that channel and sketch every single idea, if you don't know how to sketch every single idea that comes your head, good or bad, you're going to clog up that flow. So when the big one comes, the yeah. great one comes, there needs to be room. And that's why it's your job as an artist to prioritize having a balanced, healthy lifestyle, I think. Yes. Like, eat healthy, exercise, prioritize social time. Like, yeah. be around people that, that, that build you up so that your mind is always, as often as possible, your mind can be in a, in a peaceful place. And that, so that just so that, that channel stays open so that you're ready to accept great jokes or great song, great melodies or great, so I'm that, just talking a, about myself. That's a, that's a really good, really good point though, because I feel like that's something that no one really talks about right now because it's a fad. The fad now is to, oh, I don't go out. I don't spend time. I, I sing, suffer for my art. I suffer and I, not even art. Like I work my ass off because I want to be successful. I don't want to worry about this stuff 30 years from now. I'm not going to be like that guy. Yeah. Everyone's pointing their fingers and acting like they're doing something like, oh, you got to hide away for 10 years and work your ass off. I'm like, there's a way to do that, but healthy. I think we forget that it's a fad to do that, but maybe that works in business. Maybe that works in athletics. Maybe that works in other realm. But when you're talking about art, whether it's it music, creative, yeah. uh, comedy, I mean, anything like that, you don't get to you don't get to live like that. You don't get to be a part of that fad. You need to know that going out and having a beer with a buddy, uh -huh. one is night, important. That's is your job. Just as important as you practicing your scales next tomorrow morning. Yeah. Because if you don't have that balance, you're tapped into something that's channeling not from you, and it will it will kill you. It'll yeah. overtake you. Lose your mind. I mean, think about artists in the history. You'll lose your mind. You'll become a dick. You'll exclude everyone in your life. Everyone will hate you. You'll go down in history as a drunk, as a moron, you'll be, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, You'll, you'll blah, be an blah, addict. Blah. You'll be an addict because you, 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 that high that you want to get from creativity, you can't find it. So you Boom. turn to drugs and exactly. alcohol. And, and I, as I'm saying, like, you know, people need to know, like, you're, we, we can't, as cr intense creative people, you can't be a part of that fad. We'll be like, oh, you know what? I, I spent day and night researching and studying and I built my own company. It's like, that's great. I support that fully. If that's what you got to do, do it. But yeah. at the same formula is not going to work for, you know, recording an album, going yeah. up on stage and recording or recording a comedy album, record, writing a joke, writing a book, anything, painting a painting. It's just not going to work that way. It helped, yeah. You have to have that balance. And there's a lot of artists you can point to and say, well, they were miserable and it worked for them. I think those people were successful despite their misery. Yeah. And I think there is, I think that those people were more susceptible to being miserable because perhaps they were more sensitive or, and, and like, there's definitely a correlation between artists and misery. We're Certainly. sensitive to everything. Cause we're, yeah, but, but it's correlation, not causation. Yeah. And well, the other thing is that all the people that were miserable and successful, like they will look at their lives. Like, did they have someone else doing a lot of the work for them? Did they have someone else doing a lot of stuff? I mean, I'm that, sure some of them did. But that's what I mean. Like that doesn't work like that anymore. Like we right. don't live in the, t like we like take musicians. We don't live in the sixties where someone can be a miserable fuck, write great music and not worry because the record labels are taking care of everything. Yeah. yeah you yeah, know, yeah. we live in a world where it's like you, if you want to expose that, you have to expose that. You have to stay healthy. Yeah. You have to keep your shit. You know, you're, you're, you have to know what you want you have to give it your all. And you have to like know who you are and not lose yourself because no one's going to come to the rescue. Yeah. You, you, you sort of, because of like the, like the, with the technology, the way it's changed, the way information is spread, um, it's important to almost be your own manager. To be like the the studio system is so dead. Yeah, but like in the in, if you were a famous actor in the forties, I don't know, uh, basically anywhere from the twenties through the fifties or sixties, I don't know when the, the studio system sort of broke down. It was like you were just some handsome kid 
that had some talent and some studio head said, you? Maybe it's because you had sex with them, like <laughs> unless if you're Marilyn Monroe or something like that. And then they're like, you, like, we'll take care of everything. We'll take care of your press. We'll take care of your image. Just do what we say and we'll make you a star. Like, it, it, and now it's like you have to know how to promote yourself. Well, they still have that. It's, it's just people care more about playing what they want to play and giving what they want to give, you know? But do, do, but do you think that, like, is someone going to find you and tell you, here's what your branding is. Just do what I say and I'll make you a star. Or you have to sort of find your own branding now. Sure, yeah, to, to get looked at for sure. I mean, unless, <laughs> unless you, like, know the person that's in charge of that in the world, you know? Right. You know, the know who you know kind of business. But, yeah, you have to you have to pay attention. I do think that um, I do think that you don't have to. You don't absolutely have to. There's, I mean, we live in a world of possibility. It's 2019. Anything is fucking possible. Right. I think, um, I think any route is good. Any route is good, but it has to be the route that works for you. Right. Like I can't sit here and tell you that Jake, you know what? I'm going to get off social media. I'm going to stop hanging out with friends. I'm going to, you know, you know, completely exclude myself. I'm just going to sit here and record music for the next 10 years and I'll have so much content. I'll have to be famous. That doesn't work for me. Yeah. Like that can work. But it's not going to work for me because it's not going to make me happy. Right. Like, but I'm also not going to sit here and pour all my money and be on Instagram 24-7 doing selfie videos of my entire life while I'm sipping this fucking coffee because I just don't really care to do that. I yeah. like – I mean I, I like talking to people. I like being yeah. in the round. I post pictures of things that I like and things that I want. I started – like I, I, uh, I love looking back at like some of my stuff. Like I have so many hashtags because like I want to get likes and get more exposure because I want people to see what I'm doing. But at the same time, I was like, you know what? Social media already exists. I'm yeah. already posting it. It's out there. I'm not going to spend all my time promoting this and pushing all that. I'm going to spend more time trying to make what I have really, really good. Yeah. And once I have something that I really want to look at, I'll find a better way to do that. Yeah. That works for me. Gary V, uh, Tony Robbins, I mean, you name all those yeah. guys would tell me I'm wrong. And they're, they're not wrong either. Right. I think that we have to realize that you need to find the path, whatever it is. You need to know that you're going to have to do things you don't want to do. Yeah. But yeah, you have to yeah. know at what level you're going to you know, contribute to that. Yeah, yeah. This whole idea of like make yourself happy. It, 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 it's, I think if you're trying to, if you're thinking like, oh, I need to be happy all the time. That's not. That's not the what I'm talking about. It's that's balanced. Insane. Yeah, that's, you have to be balanced. <laughs> and and balanced means you don't you don't block out the bad emotions. Don't shy away from things that are going to be hard. And you have to do things that, that you don't want to do for yeah. sure. Uh, but you got to know when to pick your battles and when to think, okay, this is something that I don't want to do and it's not beneficial to me. So I'm gonna like not do it anymore. But then, yeah. I mean, I don't want to wash my dishes, but I still I, that's you have to wash I, your dishes. I can't just be like, no, that's gonna offset my my zen. Yeah, like no, you, if, then you're not really zen. Yeah, if you, if, <laughs> you, it, what, uh, uh, what uh, to use the word zen? What a zen person would do is find the joy in washing dishes, but or, or, or try to look for it. Yeah, try to like, but don't definitely don't shy away from things that you have to do. Well, so it's just. I don't know. Someone, I, I was, someone asked me once, like, what do you think the first, what do you think mental health is in your opinion? I was like, for me, mental health is acceptance. Yeah. We have to, as human beings, we have to be able to accept what we can't control, even if we don't like it. Like we have, like I was built this way. Like, you know, all right, I can't paint like Picasso, right? but I can play guitar. I can't dunk like Kobe. Right. You know, I have to accept that. I can't sit here and fight that the rest of my life. I can't fight the fact that I'm never going to be Kobe. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, it's, it sounds, it sounds insane. That sounds insane. Me saying it. No, but if I you break that down that to like everyday sense. level, like yeah. there's parts of life you just have to accept. Yeah. Not because life has to be miserable because you don't waste your time. Like it's yeah. never going to happen. Like that's, that's was never meant to happen. It's not a thing. Go out and do what you were meant to do. Like right. wash your dishes so you can go back to your art. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wash your dishes so there's not fucking ants all over your house. Yeah. Like, don't, it's, it's, there's a, there's a, there's a level of acceptance that I think people forget about. Like, we just want to go out and live our happy lives and anything is possible and all this stuff. But anything is possible is be, means that, yeah, any route is possible. You have to find what works for you. That doesn't mean you get to just stop living. You can't just stop taking a piss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know can. what? I'm shutting off my bladder. I think ping wastes too much time. That's how ridiculous some of these things are. Right. Like you can't just stop ping. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, and you can't. Yeah, you got to. You, you can't stop bathing. You can't stop paying your bills. You can't. You, yeah. You got to keep a schedule. You got there's there's stuff that you don't want to do that you have to do, and that doesn't mean that you're shying away from happiness. Yeah. 
it means that you're it just I mean if that's you're taking you have to take responsibility for certain things yeah. but then on the you also don't want to go so far where you're um like an anx an anxious nervous wreck who's trying to control everything there's yeah. just it's all about finding it's like a dance you have to find the balance and I th and it's like as far as w how do you define where that balance is I think you just know yeah you know like should I wash the dishes yes should I do I need to spend time writing jokes yes but should I like do, should I you, you know where the washing dishes turns into becoming OCD like about like oh I have to make sure that all my do I need to make sure that all my clothes are exactly an inch and a half apart in my yeah closet no I, that's ridiculous and do I need to like force myself do I, like there were times where I would I'd pop off Ivance at 10 p.m. and say, okay, I'm going to work for 13 hours through the middle of the night to write this joke. Jesus Christ. And because I, I, there was the, the sort of like combination of exhaustion with taking an upper causes like a delirium that releases a little creativity, I feel like. Um, but then I was like, <laughs> that's, that's just not a healthy, um, it's not a healthy way to live. Well, I mean, that also says like if you're having to inhibit your mind to get to the place where you naturally felt before. Then, means your life isn't happy. You're not. You're not balanced somewhere. You yeah. Need, you need to fix the balance. And yeah. Put a little more work into fixing yourself. Yeah. And that's yeah. Exactly. Like we've said so many times, it's yeah. so important that that part of the work. And it, 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 and and we have this reverence for oh, this is the work that I have to do, and I accept that. Part of the work that you can't let go of is the work that you have to do on yourself apart from your art. Yeah. So that that channel stays open. I love it, man. I feel like you. We've gotten a pretty good understanding like do you ha do you have like certain things that you know you t like mantra or like a what's the word affirmations they call it every day that you tell yourself like to keep yourself balanced um i don't have specific ones but i do i do try to make sure i meditate every day are i'm there, like, like newer triggers, to this stuff. like are there things in life when you like walk into a situation you see you're like that's definitely not a, a, like i know that to be an improper situation in my life um my addiction to my phone is something that i know is is throwing off my balance throwing off my mental health and what, uh, is, what is the addiction? Just social media? The addiction, the, the addiction just to pulling out. As, as soon as I'm in a moment sec, like where I'm uncomfortable or where I don't want to follow a, a train of thought because it's, it feels like too much effort or I'm nervous about something, any kind of unsettling feeling, it, it's, like my, it's like my binky, my phone is. Where I take it out and it provides a sense of comfort, of mindless numbing. Purpose, yeah. Yeah. I can just scroll. I mean, even just the art, even just, the, not, not the art, even just the act of taking out my phone and just pressing on Instagram and then turning my phone off or just scrolling through my phone. Turn, but just having it as this immediate binky to to comfort my unease as opposed to just living with that uneasiness. And, yeah. and, and Which is and, your job as an artist, by yeah, the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so, like... I mean, how many great jokes would come from that uneasy moment? Yeah, exactly. And that I'm just covering up with a, with a, with a, a momentary Band-Aid just to look at that light on my phone that satisfies causes me. so much anxiety. Yeah. I've never really had like what people call anxiety today until yeah. like the only time I've ever felt like that kind of bad is if I've been on Instagram too long and all yeah. of a sudden I start to like, I, I feel physically, I'm just like, oh my God, I start to tense up. Like I need to get the fuck away from this thing. Yeah. Like, I'll turn it off and like put it in a different room. Yeah. Like and just do anything else. <laughs> right. Anything else. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> that's something where I, I realize um, is something in my life. I mean, it's a drug and it and it's a, a mind numbing addiction, and it and it takes away from creativity. Like, I, it takes you away from being present in the moment. I think, and sometimes that if that moment is discomfort, you just have to like feel the discomfort and yeah. think and even embrace it. Me embrace meditate on it. Use it as the object of your meditation. Like when I feel discomfort, I try to like take a deep breath. Whether it's anxiety or sadness or nerves, whatever it is, um, and I try to focus on what are the physical sensations that are being caused. Where, where, where in my body do I feel this feeling? I and do the what same does it feel thing. like? I do the exact same thing. I the physical triggers. Like, yeah. Well, like you know, you can know what's like. What does stress feel like? What does anxiety feel like? What does anger feel like? And the moment <sighs> you feel that in a situation you're like this is stressing me out. This is making me angry. This yeah. is making me anxious. Like it's the best way to do it. And then yeah, and and just for the sake of awareness so that like say give yourself permission to feel that feeling but not let yourself be carried away with it yeah because you're aware of it yeah don't fall apart in it exactly and don't get lost don't and and just being able to differentiate yourself from your emotions i think is something that's really important and i think that the way to do that is with awareness and thinking okay what is this feeling that i'm feeling this feeling isn't me it's part it's like 
it's allowed to be here and I'm going to feel it, but I'm, I'm not, I'm going to be aware of how it's influencing my thoughts. So like when I, when I'm like at a, when I'm in traffic and I get road rage, like we all, I mean, I live in Hollywood. So I, that's a, a it's a real oh, sweet Jesus. Yeah. It's the worst. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard, but instead of like getting carried away with, Oh, fuck you. Like I'll, I'll have these like moments where, where I feel this sudden rush of emotion because someone cut me off or I'm like, I've been at a red light too long or I'm stuck in gridlock. I'll, um, I'll just sort of, uh, acknowledge the feeling and say, what is this feeling that I'm feeling right now? And how is it influencing my thoughts? And are these thoughts helpful? Are they accurate? And then all of a sudden the anger dissipates. You're just like, this is not worth it at all. It's not worth it. And, and cause it's not who I am. Yeah. And the, the way it's not, I never, it's not from trying to suppress the feeling. It's, from like, staring that doesn't in help. the face. It's staring the feeling in the face and realizing, okay, this is valid that I feel this right now, but are the thoughts that I'm thinking because of it really me? Wow. I, and this is, I mean, I, I don't always do it correctly. It's just something that I'm trying to do recently. Yeah, absolutely. Because I'm trying to, it's part of being a healthy person. Dude, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm very, very happy to hear this. Yeah. I'm very, very, I feel like it also allows, it frees you up. You know, it really makes you. I try, man. I mean, facing those things is just the same way as you have to face the creative process, right? Yeah, and yeah, I think the way you do, th there's that uh, expression, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And so that's why I'm trying to approach everything in a way that would make me a better comedian. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make myself a vessel for my art, and the way to do that is to be healthy in every aspect of my life. So then wow. you, you can't just live an unhealthy lifestyle and then like the day of a show be like, okay, I'm going to be like uh, i'm gonna have a clear mind now it starts earlier than that yeah it's a, it's a lifestyle it's yeah a you literal. have to live your whole life that way and then when you go on stage it's just an extension of who you are and that's where the greatness comes exactly exactly dude fuck yeah fuck yeah man so before we go um i want to know what in your experience what you i mean because you've i feel like you've had an incredibly growing journey i have journey full of growth and a lot of changes um Say someone 18, 17, 18 years old comes up to you and says, Jake, I want to pursue being a comic. Right. What's the first thing you tell them? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would just tell them. Um, one thing that I would warn them about is I know a lot of comedians um, do really, really well uh, at their first. So some comedians bomb their first show. Some comedians crush their first show. And, and, and I was one of those people. My first show was at like a talent show for uh, like a summer job that I had. It was like 150 people there and I nice. crushed it. And, and that's a lot because there's this nervous energy that you have when it's your first show where you're not overthinking anything and some and like, and people know that it's your first show and they're rooting for you and it can go really well. And then after that, all of a sudden it feels like you've gotten, you've gotten worse and you think, what's wrong with me? Um, yeah. But I would just tell them that's normal. And, and like, don't try to recapture what you had because there's a difference between someone... Who, who's truly excellent because they know they're aware of what they're doing and they've been doing it for so long that they know how to do that. And someone who's like accidentally funny because it's their first time doing stand up. Mm. So um, enjoy it. The success that if, I mean, and this is only some people and, and, I, and I'm acutely aware of this phenomenon because it's what happened to me. Um, so I would tell them, but don't, uh, but just be aware that that sophomore slump is, because that, that then that's when it comes to the point where you're like, okay, now let me get down to the work and see how I can capture this every time I go on stage and how I can bring it every time I go on stage, even though I know what to expect now and I have higher expectations for myself, yada, yada, yada. Um, whenever that struggle comes, even if it comes after some success, don't be afraid about, don't be afraid that you've gotten worse because um, it's just part of the process. I would tell, that would be some advice that I would give them. Um, I think I would honestly, I don't think that they, would need advice in this, in the sense that I, well, I would tell them if this is what you really love, then, then you'll keep doing it. Yeah. Cause there've been so many times where I was like, I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, like there's only so much advice that, that you can give someone. Yeah. Like, if they have a story to tell that they need to tell, they'll tell it. I would tell them, um, get on stage as much as you can do, do open mics, but, but be aware that it's a tool and it's not the performance itself. Um, because open mics are, it's different than a real crowd. And I would tell them, make sure you have a healthy balance. Make sure you find what balance works for you in terms of writing and performing. Like, hmm. um, 
some people, th their process is to like do three open mics a day Jeez. and, um, they don't do, a, they don't spend a whole lot of time writing, but because they, they don't really get a whole lot out of sitting in front of a notebook and, and that's fine. They, they get, they almost, their writing is on stage yeah. and, and that's how they come up with their material and that's fine. And, and if that's what works for you, then that's what, that's what Chris D'Elia, Chris D'Elia has never sat down in front of a notebook and written jokes. He just performs so much that it, um, he sort of developed his way of thinking from being his way of coming up with jokes from being on stage. Um, and if that's what works for you, then great. And it, or someone like Jerry Seinfeld, a huge part of his process is him and his notebook and his pen. And um, he, he has like a very, he, he sits down for exactly one hour every day, no more, no less every day to write jokes. And that's what works for him. And, and so I, I guess I would say it takes a long time to find that balance. I'm still finding it. I've only been doing comedy for five years, so I'm nowhere. I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm nowhere near figuring out I, oh no, I am near. I'm. I've, I've gotten pretty close to figuring out what that balance is for me. Um, I think that I'm. I, I definitely need to spend time in front of a notebook. That's. Hmm. Um, sometimes it can be a crutch for me, where I just think, oh, I'm doing my work be because I'm I'm writing, but I, I'm really just doing it to avoid getting on stage because I'm like I don't I don't want to, like I'm scared to test jokes out because I'm scared they won't work because I love them so much. I think the the art itself needs to be free but every task within that needs to have intention. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why I think it, it helps that Jerry signed, like it, it helps to have like a regimented writing schedule and say, if I didn't come up with anything in that hour, all that matters is that I, is that I tried and that's okay. But it also can't be like I sit down for an hour every day and just kind of twiddle my pen for an hour. No, yeah, you, you have you know? to, it has to require total focus. And that's why maybe it, it would be better to spend 45 minutes or it would be better to spend 20 minutes of, of total focus um, than to spend three hours of yeah. no focus at all. Damn, dude. So balance. Yeah. You don't you don't hear a lot of uh, a lot of young creative people talk about that. I, well, I yeah. You hear a lot of older people that have succeeded or not succeeded or have seen have been through a lot and then found you like you know what you just need to find that balance and remember that you got to live your life. Here yeah. you are, what twenty five, twenty six, twenty five, yeah talking about hey i love what i do and i'm gonna give everything i got but i want to live my life as well because i know that's gonna because help that's good because that's what's part of there was a um and one more thing i wanted to say about you someone go. young asking for advice there's a one of my favorite uh quotes and um it's not gonna be verbatim obviously because it was said in german in <laughs> 1700s um some guy came up to mozart after a concert and said uh er mozart i'm like i'm a huge fan of you um i i I want to write my own symphony and I wanted to know if you had any tips for me. Cause like, I want, I want to be a composer too. And, and Mozart said, well, symphony is a, is a pretty big musical piece. I think you might want to start with something small. I don't know what the word is for a smaller uh, piece of music, but whatever the, that word is, is the word Mozart used. He said, you should start with that and then work your way up. And this guy said, but, but Mozart, you wrote a song, you, but Mozart, you wrote a full symphony when you were five years old. And he said, yeah, I did, but I never asked anybody how. Damn! Isn't that a that's such a good? <laughs> isn't that a great quote? Whoa, that, that's fucking that's pimp. You can't. That is the, the, there's incredible. no there's no advice that Mozart could give somebody that would make them Mozart. Wow. There's no magical advice. It's almost like all advice is is warnings. Yeah, there's all, like if you've got <laughs> it, you've got it, and if you know you have it, then don't then. Then, then, like I guess, th th then don't um, let the failures get you down because there will be. F so I would just warn them. I, I would just say there's going to be failures, there's going to be suffering. But look, if you if it really matters that much to you, then you'll then you, you don't do you don't even need me to tell you to keep going because if you if it's what matters to you, then you will keep going. Wow, I couldn't quit comedy. I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I would be very upset if you quit comedy. <laughs> I mean, I, I I'm just beyond the possibility of that. Even I mean, I would. It's just I'll, I'll either succeed or I'll fail, but I'm not gonna stop. Yeah, that has nothing to do with you doing it. Yeah, yeah. Fucking rock and roll, man! You're incredible. I'm really this is this, this has wonderful. been a great convo, man. 
Thanks for coming on, dude. Dude, I love. I can't wait. Wait, so did we? Oh, we, you you use you got the multicam setup. Yeah, gonna, I'll do a little split screen. I just realized that we have this fucking thing in the shot. I'm, I'm sure we can still see your face, but oh, okay, that's okay. But uh, yeah, we got a nice little split screen here. Um, I'm gonna start my second water now. Oh, this is a little gift bag. That's for a little me? gift bag. Uh, Lucky the, me. Is there, so where can everyone find you, Jake Rush? Um, so, uh, Jake Rush. You, well, look me up on Instagram. That's where I, uh, I, like a lot of times I'll post stories of um, show. Like I'll post in my stories if I have a show coming up. I am Jake Rush. I am Jake Rush on Instagram. Okay. That's probably the best place to. And I also have some uh, clips on there. I also have clips on YouTube. Look up uh, Jake Rush comedian on YouTube. Um, hopefully, we'll be having some new clips coming out there soon. <laughs> I have a lot of new material that isn't on YouTube that um, I'm trying to get good tape of. So a lot of the stuff on YouTube is older stuff. So you let me know. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you, wait. That's actually good. Yeah. Um, I will. I will. You, you've got a good. You've got a setup. So that would actually be perfect. Um, but yeah, th there should be stuff in in like the next month or two. There should be more material coming out. But there is still a lot of my older stuff is on YouTube right now. Right on. And, and it's also on my Instagram. And but if you want to see me live, the best place to find out about my shows would be on my Instagram. Well, I hope I can have you back on soon, dude. I love talking to you. Dude, I'd love to do this again, man. This Fucking is a great, rock and roll, great man. talk. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Hike. It's great seeing you, man. Peace out. Thanks, guys.